I'm a missionary and an evangelist, have been for 68 years. Began in India, but now the world has become my parish. I was being interviewed over the TV in America and was asked this question by a commentator. You go around the world preaching, what have you got that other people haven't got? It was a good question, and I answered it in a word. I have Christ. In my approach to the non-Christian world, in the presenting of Christ, incidentally, I don't present Western civilization, the Western forms of Christianity. I preach Christ. In the presentation, we have three approaches. First, public lectures. They won't go to churches, so we have to go to them. Schools, colleges, theaters, uh, public halls of various kinds. We call them lectures. And we have leading non-Christians to take the chair. That says to the public, come on, it's all right. In this approach, I put up Christ. And I allow them to ask questions. I knew that when I did that, I was exposing myself to being, well, cross-examined by from 50 to 200 lawyers each night, keen-minded lawyers. But when I started this, this verse came to me. And when they shall deliver you up before kings and governors for my name's sake, be not anxious what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. I believe that. And I believe that through these years, over half a century, it's been given to me what I should answer. That's the first approach. It's the approach of the public lecture. The second approach is to the round table conference. I felt we should become more intimate, so we choose about 30 of the leading non-Christians, and about a third of them are Christians. And we say to them, let's take a new approach to religion. We've had the dogmatic and the comparative and the controversial and the traditional approaches to religion. Let's take one that's more akin to the method of science. In the scientific method are three outstanding things, experimentation, verification, and sharing of verifications, sharing of results. So I say, here we are, a group of people, more or less religious, using religion as a working hypothesis in life. What have we verified? What's become real to us? Will you share with us your verifications? I suggest that no one argue, no one try to make a case, no one talk abstractly, no one preach at the rest of us, but that we simply share what our faith is doing for us in experience. We say to the, not, to the atheist and to the agnostic, tell us how your atheism works, your agnosticism works. And we'll not sum it up at the close, but we'll leave it for j just as it is. We go round the circle. I say, they, I say to them, if you don't want to tell, just simply say, I pass. The amazing thing is that very few people have passed in all these years. They've been glad to tell what they have found and what they haven't found. I've listened in to this type of approach for about 25 years, intimately listening to what people said their faith was doing for them. What's been the result? I think I don't exaggerate when I say that there hasn't been one single round table conference in all the world without this result always coming into view, namely, that at the end, Christ stood in moral and spiritual command of the situation, not because of a clever summing up, not because we tried to put something over, but because he was doing something for people that nobody else was doing. 
I simply add my word at the close and leave it at that. Been one result and only one result. If I didn't know that the New Testament says that Jesus is the way, I would know it from my round table conferences. A Mohammedan walked home with me one night after one of these round table conferences and he said, uh, you, we Hindus and Mohammedans must have been more honest and sincere than you Christians in that round table conference. I asked him why. Well, he said, we all said we'd found nothing. And all you Christians said you'd found something. Therefore, we must have been more honest and sincere than you were. I said, that's one interpretation. There is another interpretation, and that is that Jesus is the way. He is the way because he's doing something for people that nobody else is doing. He is the way. I've sat there with feeling that I had the key in my hand. And that key was Christ. The third approach has been what we call the ashram approach. We felt it was not enough to give the public proclamation and have this roundtable conference approach. We must demonstrate it in a group. This word must become flesh in a group. So we organized these ashram movement, the ashram meeting, uh, what we call the ashrams, in 1930 in India, in the Himalaya Mountains. I did it per for my own purpose. I was an evangelist, and I knew how difficult it is to be a, an evangelist and a Christian. You become wordy, censorious, dogmatic, telling other people what to do, but nobody tells you what to do. I'm going to try to raise a question today and try to answer it, an important question. What happens to the self in the Christian faith? That is important because the self is the one thing we own. One thing we brought into the world, one thing we'll take out of the world, and the one thing that we have to live with intimately day by day. What happens to that self? In one of our ashrams, places of spiritual retreat, the director of the ashram in the open heart said, I used to think myself was something to be cultivated. I wonder now if it isn't a cancer to be cut out. He alternated between cultivation and a cancer, obviously confused. Many are. What happens to this self in the Christian faith? It's a problem to many people. One man said, everywhere I go, I go to and I spoil everything. Another man said, I'm a self-holic, addicted to himself as some people are addicted to alcohol. One man said, I'm glad I don't believe in a future life because I wouldn't, wouldn't want to live with myself forever. Obviously, the self can be a problem and a pain, or it can be something beautiful. Before we take up the Christian answer, I'd like to take up the non-Christian answer for just a moment. The answers of life which have come out of India have been, for the most part, world-weary and personality-weary. The world is maya and illusion. The personality is something to be transcended or to be really snuffed out. Buddha would get us into what he calls nirvana, literally the state of the snuffed out candle. I asked a Buddhist monk in Ceylon whether there was any existence in nirvana. He said, how can there be? There is no suffering, hence there is no existence. He gets beyond personality into the impersonal, so the personal problems are gone because the personality is gone. When we come to modern psychology, 
we find a tremendous reaction against that Eastern view of personality. Modern psychology affirms three things about the self. First, know yourself, accept yourself, and express yourself. Just as I would have to reject the Eastern view of personality, I would have to reject this modern psychological view of personality. Look at those three things. Know yourself. But how can you know yourself? Studying yourself in relationship to yourself and other selves. It's all earthbound. You only know yourself in relationship with God. That you're a child of God and are being made in the likeness of the Son of God. Second, they say accept yourself, but how can you accept an unacceptable self full of fears, conflicts, self-preoccupation, and guilt? Third, express yourself. You get a dozen people together, all of whom want to express themselves, then what have you got? You have the stage set for clash and confusion and jealousy and strife. What's the matter with these three things? They lack one thing that the Christian faith would put in front of all three of them. First, surrender yourself. Surrender yourself? The one thing you own? Hand it back to God? Yes. <laughs> A, a woman who is a reporter said this to me, why is God so cruel that he demands so much of us? Meaning that he demands the one and only thing we own, ourselves. She was right. God does demand that. But what happens if we do surrender that self to God? Does he wipe it out? Cancel it? Some Christians think that it is canceled. That the self is gone. But the real in Christian interpretation is not that the self is gone. God hasn't created us to uncreate us. He has created us to make us more creative. So we sur surrender this self-centered self and give it back to God. What happens? He cleanses it from selfishness and gives it back to us again. Now, affirmed, now can you uh, know yourself? Yes, as a child of God, being made in the likeness of the Son of God. Can you accept yourself? Yes, because it's an acceptable self. It's being under, it is under redemption. And you can even love yourself. Christianity teaches self-love. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And you can even like yourself. Now can you express yourself? Yes, because you're not expressing a self-centered, selfish self, but you're expressing a, se a self that is centered in God. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, then to express himself was to express Christ. Now the whole person can be affirmed. I have what I call the listening post in the early morning hours when I say to God, have you anything to say to me? One morning he said, yes, I have this. You're mine. Life is yours. Oh, I said, please say that again. He said, you're mine. Life is yours. If I belong to Christ, then life belongs to me. I can go out and master it and conquer it and rescue some good out of everything that happens. The personality then is affirmed, not canceled, affirmed. So the great problem of life is to get yourself off your own hands into the hands of God. Yourself on your own hands is a problem and a pain. In the hands of God, it is a possibility and a power, just as my fingers are rooted in the palm of my hand. So all of these outer sins are rooted in the unsurrendered self. Why do we become angry? Somebody's crossed the self. Why are we untruthful, think it's some advantage to the self? Why are we dishonest? Same reason, some advantage to the self. Why are we impure? Think we think it'll be some pleasure to the self. And why are we jealous and envious? Because this somebody's getting ahead of the self. All of these outer sins root in the unsurrendered self. They are the fruit. The unsurrendered self is the root. These are symptoms. The unsurrendered self is the disease. So don't fight symptoms. Surrender the disease. A pastor in America was very bitter against the bishop and the cabinet, the appointing powers. He felt they were not giving him 
the church is large enough for him. So he's bitter and resentful. So he said to one of his parishioners one day, the bishop and the cabinet are crucifying me. I'm hanging on the cross. The parishioner, a very wise person, said, yes, pastor, you are hanging on the cross, but you've never died. You're still wriggling with resentments. It went straight to his heart. He went off to his knees and died. Died to the little man that he was. And out of the ashes of that hour arose another man, God's man. 285 people were converted in his church that year, a church which he thought was too small for him, but he'd been too small for it. A very beautiful and uh, very talented girl was in one of our ashrams. She went out on a mountain side and sat on a rustic bridge over a mountain stream. She picked up a chip, threw it into the water and said, there goes my fears. Watched it float away, picked up another and threw it in the water and she said, there goes my resentments. Watched it float away and she picked up another and she threw it in she said, there goes my pride. Watched it float away. Then she came to the real one. She knew this was the real one. The other was preliminary. She threw it in, she said, there goes myself. And watched it float away. She came back to the ashram on wings. Oh, she said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Are we? Yes, we're free now to be creative and now to develop if we're in his hands. So when you put yourself in the hands of God, you surrender to creative love. You lie, align yourself with the creativity of God's love. And now you become a creative center in this universe. The heir to the Coca-Cola millions, the younger Candler, became an alcoholic. He fought with alcohol and lost. He came into his yard one day, half drunk, in a car with a chauffeur. He heard a voice saying, surrender yourself. It shook him. He said, oh, I've been trying to surrender alcohol, but this says surrender myself. Came in, told his wife what he'd heard. They got on their knees. And he said, I never heard such a prayer as my wife prayed. When we got up from our knees, I knew that I was through with alcohol, I was gone. I asked my wife to go off and get a ribbon. I took the bottle out of the cupboard and tied this ribbon around it and put it back into the cupboard as a museum specimen. I knew that I would never touch it again. I could go past it day by day, and he did. Never touched it again. Before he died, he said, I'm giving away 90% of my income. I want to give 100% before I, before I die. Here was a man, conquered by habit, now on top of his world, when he tried not to surrender alcohol, but to surrender himself. The alcohol was the symptom. The unsurrendered self was the disease. So then, don't fight your symptoms. Surrender the disease. The self is the center of all our problems. Yourself on your own hands is a problem and a pain. Yourself in the hands of Christ is a possibility and a power. Therefore, when you surrender to God, that's your freedom. For his will is our freedom. I hope you'll do it. God bless you. Dr. Stanley Jones, we are very glad to have you as guest in the Rotary Club of Henry Sand in Sweden. We are happy that you have promised us to talk about Christianity and the world situation. And now I'll give you the floor.
I've been asked by your committee to speak to you on the subject of Christianity and the world situation. If Christianity has any message for this age, it must speak at the, to the central need of this age. And the central need of this age is peace. If I were to put my ear down close to the heart of humanity to listen to its inmost sigh, on both sides of the curtain, I think I would hear one word, peace. For if we don't have peace, we don't have anything else. Nobody can win an atomic energy war. Both sides will be ruined. Some say in 24 hours, others four. Doesn't matter whether it's four or 24, both sides will be ruined. So if we don't have peace, we don't have anything else. What is Christianity to say in regard to peace? Well, when the World War came on, a verse arose out of the scriptures and spoke to my condition, as the Quakers would say, became authoritative. This one, to make peace by the creation in himself of a new man out of both parties. The situation there, you remember, was between Jew and Gentile. The Jew felt he had a right to rule because of divine commission. The Roman Gentile felt he had a right to rule because of imperial Roman might. There stepped into that situation a man born a Jew, but also a Roman citizen and deeper a Christian. Paul said, if Jew conquers Gentile, there'll be no peace. Or if Gentile conquers Jew, there'll be no peace. You've got to get them both to change and come to a third position. Gathering up the truth in the Jew and the truth in the Gentile into a third something, a new man out of both parties. The emergence of that new man out of both parties would bring peace, for neither one would conquer the other, but something beyond each would conquer both. Is that the way to peace? To produce that new man out of both parties in every tense situation? Yes, I think it is. He picked out of reality there a universal principle which, if applied to any situation, would bring peace. Let us take the simplest situation, if it be simple, between a husband and a wife. If the husband conquers the wife and suppresses her, knowing women as I do, there'll be no peace. Or if the wife conquers the husband and conquers him, knowing men as I do, again there'll be no peace. You've got to get them both to change. Gathering up the truth in the husband, the truth in the wife, into a third something, a new man out of both parties. The union conquers both. That would bring peace because neither one would conquer the other, but something beyond each would conquer both. Take other situations. Take the situation between capital and labor. If capital conquers labor and suppresses labor, there'll be no peace. Or if labor conquers capital and suppresses capital, again, there'll be no peace. You've got to get them both to change and come to a third position, gathering up the truth in capital and the truth in labor into a third something, a new man out of both parties. What would be that new man out of both parties in industry? As I see it, it would be a cooperative man. What do I mean by cooperation? I believe it would mean a labor capital management and a division of the profits and losses. I said that in London, Ontario, Canada. The leading industrialist came up to me at the close of the meeting and he said, you're right. My factory was a feud. I was giving as little as possible. My men were doing as little as possible. We were tied in knots, getting nowhere fast. I called in the men one day and I said, look here, we're on the wrong basis, a pagan basis. I'm on it, you're on it. Thou shalt love thyself. Let's change it to a Christian basis. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Hitherto I've had the right of hiring and firing. Now I give it to you. You decide who comes in and who stays into the factory. And we'll set aside 23 and a third percent of the profits of this institution for labor above wages. We'll work it out together. He said immediately the spirit of my factory changed. I didn't have to weed out slackers, labor weeded them out, for they were slacking not only against capital, but against labor. It was to everybody's interest to work and to work hard, for the more everybody worked, the more everybody received. My factory turned from a feud to a family overnight. Why? Because they produced a new man out of both parties, and that brought peace. Take the situation between the races. 
its tents throughout the world. If the white races conquer the colored races, there'll be no peace. Or if the colored races conquer the white races, again, there'll be no peace. You've got to get them both to change and come to a third position, gathering up the truth in the white races and the truth in the colored races into a third something, a new man out of both parties. What would that new man out of both parties among the races mean? It would mean a cooperative order between the races because each race has something to give to the other races. In this rise of the social revolution, we're discovering this as the underdog begins to come up to the top. The dispossessed of the world are rising. We've discovered that there are no permanently inferior races, no permanent superior races, undeveloped races and developed races, but no permanently inferior, no permanent superior. Given the same stimulus and the same incentive, the brain of humanity will come out about the same. I don't know what that does for you. To me, it's good news. There are infinite possibilities in everybody. There was, when I was in Africa, a colonial speech that went around. It was this. All nations have left their monuments, physical monuments, to a great cultural past, except Africa. They've left no monuments, nothing but a green jungle. Meaning, because they have no past, they have no future. It's true that the African has no past except a green jungle, but that doesn't say he hasn't got a future. And that doesn't say that he's inferior. He is not inferior. He's got the same brain capacity as anybody else. In Kenya, we had a school there for African boys, and they got 99% passes in a foreign language. Cambridge examinations. European schools, 80% passes. 30, yeah, in, in Indian schools, 30% passes. Why the difference? The African had an incentive. He said, you say I'm inferior, I'll prove to you I'm not. He overcompensated and went ahead. There are infinite possibilities in everybody, everywhere. That's good news. And we must bring out those infinite possibilities and con to contribute to a world culture. Take the conflict between individualism and collectivism. One represented by American, the other represented by Russia. If individualism represented by America conquers collectivism represented in Russia, there'll be no peace, plan revenge. Or if it's the other way around, there'll be plan, re plan revenge. You've got to get them both to change and come to a third position gathering up the truth in individualism and the truth in collectivism into a third something. I'm persuaded that individualism is a half-truth. It forgets that life is social. And collectivism is a half-truth. It forgets that life is individual and personal. So something beyond individual and collectivism is struggling to be born. Individualism is a half-truth, forgets that life is social. Collectivism is a half-truth, forget forgetting that life is individual and personal. Something beyond each is struggling to be born. A new society where you love your neighbor, the truth in collectivism, as yourself, the truth in individualism. A kingdom of God society is struggling to be born beyond individualism, beyond collectivism, but gathering up the truth in each into a higher synthesis, the kingdom of God society. I believe that is the meaning of this era, that something beyond individualism and beyond individualism and beyond collectivism is going to be born. I look forward to that kingdom of God society. One last word. Just two great programs for peace. Leagues, pacts, treaties, and charters between sovereign nations. One program. The other, world government. Which of these two can bring peace? I am persuaded that leagues, pacts, treaties, and charters between sovereign nations are truces between wars. We had 4,800 treaties in operation when this last war came on. We broke them without compunction or without hesitation. The peace treaties of, of the world have lasted an average of two and a half years in human history. They were supposed to last forever, but they lasted two and a half years. Why? because leagues, pacts, treaties, and charters are simply truces between wars. 
we've got to come to world government. I want a government, a world government, with collective security, under which Russia would be free to carry out her way of life within Russia. America would be free to carry out her way of life within America. All other nations the same. Then whichever can produce the better order morally wins. I'm not afraid of that test because I believe we can produce a better order of society out of free men rather than out of slaves. Are we going to make this world government before calamity strikes us? I believe we will. I believe that having brought us so far along, God is not going to allow us now to blow ourselves to pieces with the atomic bomb. He's invested much in humanity, and his stake is a cross. And having invested so deeply, I don't believe he's going to let us ruin ourselves before we come to the consummation. I think we're going to skirt this world war, uh, this third world war. We're going to harness the atomic energy to the collective good, and we could abolish poverty tomorrow. You say that's wishful thinking. Of course it's wishful thinking, for I wish it with all my heart. But it's based upon the nature of God. God, I believe, is going to take us through this crisis into a better day, and that is the coming of the kingdom of God. That would be the new man out of all parties. I believe, therefore, that the Christian has the answer in this formula to try to produce in every situation a new man out of both parties, get them both to change and come to a new situation, a new basis, a new man out of both parties. I believe that would bring peace. So that's the Christian answer as I see it to the world situation today and I believe it's workable and that nothing else will work. We invite you to hear Dr. E. Stanley Jones, Methodist missionary evangelist, speak on the subject, Jesus is Lord. Many people are puzzled over the complexity of religion. In the Strait Settlements, a Chinese father sent an application blank to one of our schools to have his child admitted. On the application blank was a column which said, what is your religion? And the Chinese father wrote the word confusion. A lot of people are confused over this matter of religion. I'd like to reduce it, if I can, to simplicity. The earliest Christian creed was just three words. If thou wilt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. No man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. In both of those places, the phrase, Jesus is Lord, is in quotation marks, showing it was used as an early Christian confession, perhaps the earliest Christian creed. They tell us that all great discoveries are a reduction from complexity to simplicity. The false hypothesis is always complex. You have to use a number of words to cover up the, the falsity. If you tell lies, you have to have a very good memory to remember what you've said. And the more lies you tell, the better memory you have to have. But to tell the truth each time is simple. Of all the great reductions from complexity to simplicity, this is the greatest. The whole of the Christian faith reduced to three words. Jesus is Lord. And the amazing thing is that this grew up among the Jews who were fiercely monotheistic. Their characteristic word was from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God was Lord. These same people found themselves saying, Jesus is Lord. How did that happen? Not likely. They found that Jesus was doing something that only God could do. That his touch upon life was the touch of God. 
and from their unwilling lips fell the great confession, Jesus is Lord, not will be, is. And they were right to begin with Jesus. We don't begin with God, we don't begin with man. If you begin with God, you don't begin with God, you begin with your ideas of God, which are not God. And we don't begin with man. If you begin with man, you begin with the problems of man, and if you begin with a problem, you'll probably end with a problem, and in the process, you'll probably become a problem. We don't begin with God, and we don't begin with man. We begin with the God-man. And from him we work out to God, and from him we work down to man. In his light, we see life. They fastened upon Jesus, the incarnate. Were they right? Profoundly. Psychologists tell us that the three basic needs in human nature are these. First, to belong. Second, to have, uh, to have significance. And the third, to have reasonable security. The first necessity of human nature is to belong. I listen to two men, good man and noble, say in differing language, that the first thing in life is to have personal freedom. I put up my question marks. I don't believe that the first thing in life is personal freedom. I believe the first thing in life is personal bondage. Define what to obey, where to bend the knee, where to give your supreme loyalty. These early Christians said, it's Jesus. And how did they come to that conclusion? They came to that conclusion because they found Jesus was Lord in three directions. First, he was Lord of the past. Now, this past is a troublesome business. We say it's past, but it's not past. It invades today as guilt. What are we to do with this sense of guilt? Some people say, draw the curtain and forget it. You can't. Others say, pile up good deeds to balance what you've done. You can't. What can you do? Nothing. You're caught. Between the deeds of yesterday and the coming judgment, and conscience pronounces the verdict beforehand. What can you do? Nothing. If anything's done, it's got to be done from the side of God. Will he do anything? The God that I see in the face of Jesus Christ has done something. We couldn't get to him, so he comes to us bearing our sins in his own body and offers us forgiveness in a nail-pierced hand. A big businessman in the Middle West said to me one day, I've got a, an awful sense of guilt in my life. Night after night, I've tied up my arm to the bedpost so I couldn't sleep decently to punish myself and atone for my sins. I said, that hasn't taken away the guilt, has it? He said, no, it's still there. I said, my brother, you're on the wrong track. You're offering your suffering to God for atonement for your sins. Don't offer your blood. Accept the blood of the Son of God. Empty your hands and take the gift of God. We prayed together. A few days later, I got a letter from that man. He said, I didn't know a man could be as happy as I am. All that sense of guilt is gone. I went to the church the next day and sang hymns I had never sung before. And I went to my business the next day with a lightness of step I'd never known. And for the first time in my life, I let my full weight down on the universe. He found Jesus was Lord of that past. He couldn't see it any longer, but he saw the Savior from the past. Then he's Lord of the present. Now, this present is a difficult business. It demands that we assume responsibility for this business called life. Jung says there's a difference between my psychiatry and that of Freud. Freud says that the basis of neurosis is in the past, in childhood. I say it's in the present. What is the responsibility which this patient is refusing to assume? Why is he dodging out into illness, into illusion? Has Jesus any message for this business called life? Can he help us to assume its responsibility without evasion? Can he give us nerve and courage and power to go into this thing called living with adequacy and power? Yes. For he walked up to the worst thing that could happen to him, namely his death, 
and turned it into the best thing that could happen to the world, namely its redemption. And when you can take the worst thing that can happen and turn it into the best thing that can happen, then you know how to live. If not on account of, then in spite of. Jesus has mastered this business of life. He's Lord of every difficulty that you face because he can turn every difficulty into a door, every impediment into an instrument, every Calvary into an Easter morning. You don't bear pain, you use it. You take hold of it and make something out of it, just as the lotus flower reaches down into the muck and mire and takes up the muck and mire and the purpose of its life and transmutes it into the beauty of the lotus flower. So you can take hold of the raw material of human living some of it pleasurable, some of it painful, some of it complimentary, some of it critical, and you can take it up into the purpose of your life and transmute it and make it into something else, character, achievement. Jesus is Lord of the present. He's Lord of sorrow, Lord of pain. A woman came to one of our ashrams in Canada. Her life had been shattered by the death of her husband ten years before. She stood up one day and she said, you know, I used to go out in my yard and listen to a bird that would come up in the tree every morning and say its plaintive note. It seemed to be sympathizing with me. Her name was Helen. So the bird seemed to be saying, poor Helen, poor Helen, poor Helen. She said, I came to this ashram and Brother Stanley stood by the lakeside and gave his vesper addresses. And his sentences were punctuated by a deep-throated bullfrog, which kept saying, so what? So what? So what? Now she said, I've been listening to the gospel according to that bird, self-pity, poor Helen, poor Helen. Now I'm going to listen to the gospel according to that bullfrog. I've lost my husband, so what? I've had sorrow, so what? I found Jesus was Lord of the present. A man was converted in the factory. He said, before I was converted, I found I was wearing out my shoes at the heels because I was rocking back on, on my heels, on the defensive, afraid of this business called life. After I was converted, I found that I was wearing out my shoes at the toes. Life was tipped forward expectant, unafraid, full of adventure, full of initiative. Jesus tips life forward with a mastery of this business called life. He's Lord of the present and he's Lord of your temptations, Lord of your passions, Lord of your appetites. On the West Coast, a very leading editor said to me, you know, I've been an alcoholic. I looked at him and I said, impossible. He said, yes. Alcohol gradually got the better of me. I fought it, I lost. I went to a sanatorium to see if they could do anything for me. They brought in a man there one day in a very bad condition. I turned to a doctor and I said, Doctor, that man's in an awful condition, isn't he? He said, yes. But within a year, he'll be well. Within a year, you won't be well. It struck me like a blow. I went out under the stars that night, lonely and defeated. Within a year, you won't be well. And there I remembered what a leper said to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And the answer came back swift. I will be thou clean. He said, <clears throat> I lifted up my hands to heaven and I cried, Oh, Jesus, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And the answer came back swift. I will be thou clean. He said, that moment the power of alcohol was broken in my life. I didn't fight against it, it was gone. Haven't touched a drop since. Jesus is Lord. Lord of your past, Lord of your present, Lord of your appetites, he's Lord. Then he's Lord of the future. Now many people are afraid of the future because it holds within it death. And many people are afraid of death. Has Jesus any word about death? He went down through it, came up out of the other side and said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. If you belong to Christ, you do not belong to death. He's Lord of it. 
But many people are not so much afraid of this business called death as they're afraid of this thing called time. They see time coming and going and leaving its marks upon them. They look in the looking glass and see the marks of coming age. They get frightened, then they go try to turn back the clock by various subterfuges. It's a losing battle, my sister, my brother. Then what are you to do? There's a passage in the book of Revelation which I love. The tree of life bears 12 manner of fruit, each month having its own fruit. I love that. Can each month, each period of life have its own fruit, its own beauty? I found it so. Each period of life can have its own particular charm and beauty. I loved being 24. I loved being 34. I loved being 44. I loved being 54. I loved being 64. And now I love most of all being 74. I wouldn't be 24 for anything. It's too much fun to be 74 and a Christian. All you have to do is to walk out this way, on this way, straight into the sunset. And every day I say to myself, Stanley Jones, if you want to live, this is the way. If you don't want to live, live some other way and get hurt. The whole thing reduced to simplicity. When I was 74, God said to me, I'm going to give you the best 10 years of your life, the next 10 ahead. Four have gone, six to go. These four have been the best four so far. When I get to the end of this first 10 years, I'm going to ask for an extension of another 10 years. I've given advance notice. <laughs> when I get to the end of the second 10 years, I'm not quite sure whether I will or not. But it's fun to be 74 and a Christian. You've caught your rhythm and your harmony and your song and your way to live and you know that Jesus is Lord. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And now my last word. Have you made him Lord? That means self-surrender. A woman said to me one day, I've found you out. You've only got one remedy, self-surrender. I said, you're right. I cannot go down any road with anybody on anything without coming straight up against the necessity of self-surrender, getting yourself off your own hands into the hands of God. Self-surrender. He's Lord, not of this, that, and the other, but of you. By a complete and absolute self-surrender. And that's my message. Jesus is Lord. Around the world, we've adopted that as our farewell and our greeting. We put up our three fingers. When we meet each other and say goodbye to each other, we put up our three fingers. Jesus is Lord. That's our witness and our conviction. And nothing can be greater. <laughs>